Chapter 23 and 24. Abby invites Sean, Denver, and me to join the crew after the guests have been served dinner. After the leftovers are scraped into mustard-colored plastic salad bowls, we feast on ham and rice, slices of challah dipped in minestrone and boiled broccoli. The guests have gone through all the homemade dessert, so Abby breaks out Oreos and pours us glasses of milk. I break an Oreo in two pieces. I casually flip one half into the air and pray that it lands in my mouth and impresses the socks off Abby. I succeed, but a little too well. The Oreo chunk bull eyes, bull's eyes my throat, and a second later I'm choking and swigging down milk, coughing with little explosions that send the milk spurting out of my nose. I'm fine, I whisper hoarsely when Dan offers to give me the Heimlich. Denver breaks an Oreo into quarters. He takes a swig of milk and tilts his head back. A piece of Oreo flies behind his back and over his shoulder, landing with a plop on his open mouth. Where'd you learn to do that, asks Abby. Envy wriggles through my veins again. I dab milk off my nostrils. Denver flips another quarter of Oreo into his mouth. My older brother, Harry, he had the sharpest eyes and best aim of anyone in the neighborhood. When we were in middle school, he could pitch a dime into a water glass from 50 feet away. A third quarter of Oreo lands neatly onto his tongue. Almost made it to the big leagues last year. Dan lifts his eyebrows. Why almost? The last piece of Oreo clicks off Denver's front tooth. He tries to grab it, but his hand goes wide and the cookie tumbles to the floor. Instead of picking it up, he just stares at it blankly. Did something happen to him, I ask? Yes. Denver's voice is short. A thick silence fills the air. I shouldn't press. It would be mean, and I know it, but I'm so jealous of Denver's neat little Oreo trick that's making Abby's eyes shine that I lose my head, I press. Was there an accident? No answer. Denver's shoulders hunch. He stares mutely at the fallen cookie with dimming eyes, lost in the memory of what happened. I know that look of grief and numbness and disbelief at the unfairness of life. I've gone too far. Suddenly I feel horrible. Hey, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to pry. As if shaking off a nightmare, Denver's eyes come back into focus. He looks at me and sighs. No, it's all right. He takes a deep breath. My brother was the star of the baseball team all throughout high school. His senior year of high school, they were 18 and 0. The three of those games had been no hitters. Harry threw a mean curve ball, but it was his fastball that pegged him for the major leagues. He had it up to 91 miles per hour by the time his team got to the state championships. A big talent scout was going to be there. Harry was certain he was going to be drafted into the major leagues. He just had to pinch one perfect game, pitch one perfect game. Then the night before the big game, Harry and I got into a fight. It was over something stupid, what Netflix show to watch. I don't even remember. Denver bends down and picks the piece of Oreo off the floor. He turns it in his hands as if it's a magic eight ball with all the answers. Funny how little things can change your life. We ended up wrestling for the remote. At one point, I grabbed it and yanked. Harry tripped over the couch. His right eye landed on the corner of the coffee table, and that was the end of his baseball career. Without dusting off any dirt, Denver puts the Oreo in his mouth and chews. A few weeks later, he ran away from home. My parents went crazy trying to find him, but he was 18. Legally, he could disappear if he wanted to, and he did. We haven't seen or heard from him in over a year. Except for the soft ticking of a wall clock above the sink, it is quiet in the kitchen. Sean puts a hand on Denver's back. Come on, man, let's go to bed. He keeps his hand on Denver and guides him out the front door. As they head out, the glow of the hut light silhouettes them against the wooden floors, two shadows melting together to keep each other standing. Later, I head over to the tent site and set up next to Sean and Denver's tent. As I crawl in and zip up the mosquito netting, Moose hops up on the platform. He turns a couple of times before settling down in front of the tent. As I fall asleep, I think about how surprising life is. I started on this trail because I wanted to get away from the bad luck and hurt in my life. I had run into plenty of trouble at the beginning of the trail, but right now, Andy's marvel seems to be protecting me, but it hasn't stopped me from running into bad luck and hurt of others. Yet somehow, through sharing stories of the ways life can knock you down, there's friendship, understanding, strength. I think about Denver, how he's such a good guy, and how his goodness became twisted into guilt over something that wasn't his fault. He'll probably feel responsible for his brother's accident for the rest of his life, even though it was just bad luck. I can hear Sean and Denver shifting in their sleeping pads in the tent next to mine. I'm glad they have each other. I think about the story Denver told me about how he and Sean became friends, how they protect each other. Then I think about the story Wing in it told me, how people are thrown into bad situations that are none of their fault, and how they figure their way through it. Maybe life isn't about luck, good or bad. Maybe it's a lot about leaning on others when things get rough, and being leaned on in return. 
Outside the tent, Moose lets out a long, slow fart. I smile. I started alone, but we're going to finish this trail together, me and Moose and the other half of my shadow, Lucas. I promise, I whisper, I will see us through all the way to Cotta Dim. Chapter 24 The next morning, I wake to a thick fog. A cold wind presses against the tent, and I close the vestibule to get an extra bit of warmth while I dress. Unlike the hot, sticky mugginess of the day before, this day promises to be wet and chilly. A black nose appears in the tent, and I se- the second I unzip it, I have to push Moose back so he doesn't invade my sleeping bag. He's clean, but he still smells like damp dog. Sean is on the platform, stirring oatmeal into a pot of boiling water. There's a storm coming, he says, as I clamber out of my tent. How can you tell? I break out two cliff bars and a hunk of cheddar cheese. I toss one of the bars to Moose. I check the weather forecast at the hut this morning. Gusts on Washington are going to be over 60 miles an hour, and the wind chill is expected to get about 20 degrees. But it was so hot yesterday. I can't believe there could be such a huge difference in temperature in less than 24 hours. Sean shrugs. Welcome to the Whites. He takes out a jar of peanut butter and adds a couple of spoonfuls to the oatmeal mixture. We eat our breakfast in silence. Where's Denver, I ask, as I finish off the last of my cheese and crumple empty wrappers into my food bag. He left early this morning. He told me to meet him on top of Washington. Wanted to do the last bit of hiking by himself. That's right, you two are finishing your trip today. I feel a twinge of sadness. Denver and Sean had saved me on that rain-drenched day when I had nearly given up. Without them, I would probably have quit the trail. But now they are leaving, and I will really be on my own. I lick my bowl and spoon clean, then tuck them back into my pack. After breaking down my tent, I stop by the hut quickly to say goodbye to Abby. I call to Moose, and as we turn back down the trail, I see Sean. He has a scowl on his face. Hurry up, he says. When I tell him he doesn't have to wait for me, his scowl deepens. Normally, I'd agree. I hate waiting for you, but you're not hiking in this weather by yourself, he says curtly. He turns his back to me and starts hiking. I grin and follow him, with Moose not far behind. A mile later, the rain begins. We pause for a moment to shrug into our raincoats, and I ask Sean a question that I've been wondering since that morning. Did you know about Denver's older brother? Yeah, Denver worshipped him. Sean turns his head to the side and puts a finger over a nostril. He exhales hard, and a snot rocket flies out the side to the tra- of the trail. When Harry disappeared, Denver nearly went crazy with guilt. How long ago was that? Sean clears the second nostril. Come to think of it, it was exactly a year to this day that Harry ran away. He goes utterly still for a moment. I have a bad feeling about this. Maybe I shouldn't have let Denver hike by himself this morning. I'm sure he's fine, I say. Nevertheless, Sean hitches up his backpack and shoots down the trail as though a swarm of bees were after us. Before long, we are above the tree line. The rain has increased to a pelting clatter, and we can barely see the trail ten feet in front of us. I pull my rain hood over my head and cinch it tight. Moose whimpers. Sorry, buddy, I tell him. There will be no shelter, no trees to break the wind until we reach the next hut over Lake of the Clouds. The higher we climb, the more the temperature drops. Without the trees to protect us, the wind rises to a sideways howl. I lean against it and hope it keeps up. With a steady wind, I can adjust my body to constantly battle the pressure. If the wind stops, I'd go tumbling. The trail becomes all rocks and boulders, slippery with lichen and rain. It is only 4.8 miles between Mitzpah and Lake of the Clouds, but it seems like an impossible distance as our pace slows to a crawl. Crawl. A jagged arc of lightning cuts through the rain and fog. It flashes across the sky like a glowing, warming finger. Moose lets out a high, frightened bark. Nobody should be above the tree line in a lightning storm. Odds are you are the tallest object sticking out from the mountain. The weather has just turned from bad to dangerous. If I had been here with Lucas and his dad, there would have been no question about it. We would have turned around and gone back into the trees as fast as possible. I think we should go back, I shout. Sean doesn't answer, but quickens his pace. I need to find Denver, he says. His voice is low, urgent. His strides lengthen. His legs are long, too long. Behind me, Moose stumbles on a slippery boulder. I can't keep up, I yell. Sean is a couple of yards ahead of me and adding more distance between us fast. He doesn't stop. I can't tell if he hasn't heard me or if he doesn't care. The rain turns to hail. I tuck my head and scurry along as fast as I can, making sure Moose is still with me. The chattering hill becomes a roar of quicking ice. I feel like I've stepped under a falling, frozen waterfall. I concentrate on my boots and putting one of them in front of the other. When I finally look up, Sean is gone.